Justice triumphs. <laughs> Police headquarters, Albany, New York. Name, James Martin Scott. Age, 41 years. Cause of death, knife wound through heart. Classification, murder. Investigation, proceeding. <laughs> The Mutual Broadcasting System presents another thrilling case from the files of true justice stories, followed by millions of readers each week in the New York Sunday News and its syndicate. Tonight's case, The Man Who Died Twice. As our reenactment of this real crime begins, a 1932 Buick sedan turns out of the little New England town of Castleport and heads out on the highway. The man at the wheel and his slight, weak-faced companion are silent as they drive five miles through the dark countryside. For this October night, William Hugan and his friend James Martin Scott are embarking upon the first step of a most important business. The business of committing the perfect crime. Scott, the frightened-faced little man, speaks. William, I, I, I know you won't like what I'm going to say, but, but I don't think we should do this. Oh, you don't? No, William, I don't. After the money we've spent for those insurance policies, after all the planning I've done... $150,000 worth of planning. Yes, I know, William. You've thought of everything, but but the police... The police. Uh, a dumb county sheriff and those drugstore cowboys he calls his deputies. You're afraid of them, I suppose. Yes, William, I am. I'm, I'm afraid of the whole thing. You're not backing out now, my friend. I've got too much at stake to be stopped by you or anybody else. For years, I've been a nobody in this town. A jack of all trades. Me, with more education than the mayor. More brains than anybody else in this whole doggone now, town. Now, nobody's denying that, William. Everybody knows that you're much smarter than I am, but... Well, the police and the insurance companies, they have ways... No to... way to figure this one out. Because I've tried to tell you a thousand times it's perfect. Oh, very well. Just as you say, William. All right. Now, the county burial ground is a half a mile ahead. We'll stop here outside your workshop. Oh, but... But somebody might see the car while we're over there digging in the graveyard. We want them to see it, you fool. In case we're spotted in the graveyard, we'll have to run for it. If they see the car, it'll make it look as if we've been working on your invention in the shop all the time. Oh, oh yes, yes, I, I forgot. Forgotten. You'd forget your own head if it wasn't fastened on. Now, William. Come on, we'll get the lights on in the workshop and draw the blinds. Yes, William. Hurry it up, James. Get those shades pulled down. All the way. I will. William, I just thought, if somebody should come here while we're at the graveyard... Has anybody ever taken enough interest in your inventions to visit you? No. No one ever has. In all the years I've been working here, no one has ever... Then they're not going to tonight. Now, come on. We don't want to keep our dead friend waiting. <laughs> Beneath the pitch-black night sky, the two men reopened the newly dug grave of the late George Johnson, an unfortunate man who died in a poverty so bitter that his family could not afford a private burial plot. This is the next-to-last step in the perfect crime of William Hugan and James Martin Scott. And with the pauper's body in the back of the workshop, they proceed to the next and final step in their plan. Mr. Hanson? Mr. Hanson? Are you awake? Who is it? Mr. Hugan. Oh, just a minute. Well, rather late to be calling, isn't it? I'm, I'm sorry if I bothered you and Mrs. Hanson. I saw your lights from James Scott's workshop. I, I thought you might have some coffee on the stove. I'm chilled through. It happens we have. Come in. Thank Come you. in. Who is it here? Mr. Hugan wants some coffee. Says he's chilled through. Been working with your friend over in the workshop, I suppose. Yes, but uh, I don't have James' powers of concentration, I guess. Uh-huh. No heat over there, you know, and I, I felt chilly. Huh. Silly business working on them full inventions. Think you'd have more sense, you gun. No, Carl. Oh, he's right, Mrs. Hanson. I don't know how James stands it, working those gas and oil fumes night after night. But I really think he's on the track of something now. A new oil refining process. Oh, he is, eh? Mm-hmm. Well, I might take a little visit over there with you. 
Never seen his workshop. By all means, Mr. Hanson. And you can take the coffee with you and have it over there. It's not far to the workshop. It'll still be hard. Oh, but and... I, I don't like to drag your husband away. Nonsense. Uh, if Scott's finally hit on something, I'd like to say it. But I'm, I'm not sure that I... Any reason you don't want me to come? Oh, oh, no, no. Of course not, Mr. Hanson. You don't know how much I want you to come. <laughs> Of course, this is just a working model, you understand, Mr. Hanson. Uh, built to scale, naturally. But it should give you an idea of how the refining machine will operate. Yeah, very you interesting, see, I'm I... sure. Uh, but now oh, I... But, but surely you, you'll want to see how the acceleration machine works. It's the basis of the whole refining process. Well, not tonight. Okay. Uh, some other time, perhaps. Uh, James is like a child about these things. You mustn't disappoint him, Mr. Hanson. It'll only take a minute. Well, now, really, Mr. Yogan, I've got to oh, go please. back. please. You, you will let me demonstrate it, Mr. Hanson, won't you? Oh, all right. Oh, good. This is it right here. Now, I switch on the power for this part of the machine, and... Well, what's happened? Oh. All the lights have gone out. Blow a fuse, I imagine. Yes. Uh, oh, I just used the last one I had. I, I wonder, Mr. Henson, would you have a spare fuse at your house? Oh, yes, sure. Oh, good. And, well, William, could you go along with him and... Glad to, John. Back? Come along, Mr. Henson. Uh, the door's over here. Watch your step, though. Careful, Careful. Uh, so dark in here without any lights. Uh, uh, while you're gone, William, I'll see if I can patch up this fuse. Be careful, John. Don't take any chances with all this oil around. Uh, here's the door, Mr. Hanson. Well, what do you think of John's invention? Neither your friend's an idiot or a genius. Myself, Mr. Yogan, I happen to be a dealer in junk, and I wouldn't know about such things. <laughs> Chilly night. In for a cold winter. Good Lord. James workshop. Great heavens, it's on fire. All that oil. Come on. Oh, just hurry. James. James, where are you? Stand back. Don't be a fool. You can't have it now. The cop's going up like a box of matches. I've got to get him out there. James. Poor oh, devil. He couldn't possibly have escaped. Now, oh, come along, man. Come along. We've got to phone the sheriff's office and the fire department. James. James. Come along. I've got a spot of brandy at the house. I think it'll do you good. Nothing more we can do here anyway. The two men turn and walk slowly away from the burning shack. But if Hanson, the chance witness to the tragedy, could only see the face of his companion in the darkness, he'd notice that William Hugan is smiling triumphantly, as befits the man who's just been a leading partner in the perpetration of a perfect crime. Across the clearing on the other side of the burning workshop, a figure runs to the outskirts of the woods, then turns, looks back. For just that moment, an observer, if there were one, would see the face of a man believed to be trapped in the flames. The weak, frightened face of the inventor, James Martin Scott. A short time later. All right, men, get your hoses coiled up and get your gear back on the truck. Well, Sheriff King, no danger of spreading now as far as out. <laughs> Anything else we can do for you? No, no, I guess not, Chief. Up to the corner now. Yeah, not much left to Scott, poor devil. Maybe he had something in that new invention of his, but we'll never know after this. Well, we'll be going now, Sheriff. Hey, uh, call me if there's anything I can do. You bet, Chief. So long. So long. All right, boys. All right. Easy now. Yeah, that's it. Now wrap the sheet around the body and put it in the ambulance. They'll have to take it to the county morgue for an autopsy. Uh, it's nasty business, coroner. Yes, Sheriff. Uh, I don't realize how perishable human body is until you see... Well, what these deputies dug out of the ashes. Poor James. Huh? What a, a terrible way to die. Oh, well, Mr. Hugan, I thought you'd gone. I I couldn't somehow. James was the best friend I had in this world, Sheriff. I know. That sort of thing happens to all of us. Uh, you've got my deepest condolences, son. Well, uh, got good night's work ahead. See you in the morning, Sheriff. Uh, good night, Good night, Corner. Mr. Hugan. Good night, mm -hmm. Corner. I just can't seem to believe it, Sheriff. Poor James, gone. Yes, it's been a bad blow for you, Hugan. But I'm kind of glad Mr. Hanson was with you when it happened. Glad, Sheriff? Yeah. Why? What 
What difference does that make? Yeah, it makes another witness in case the body can't be identified. Otherwise, it might be trouble. Trouble? Yes, especially if there's any insurance claim involved. Insurance? Why, it, it never occurred to me that poor James might have insurance. Well, there's no use of hanging around here any longer. we will keep a guard here all night, see that the rooms aren't disturbed. Well, good night, Sheriff. Good night, Hugan. Try not to take it so hard. I'll... I'll try, Sheriff. Yes. I'll try very hard. <laughs> Sheriff King speaking. Uh, this is Coroner Sheriff. Yes, Coroner, what's the report? And I'm only country doctor, Sheriff. Lord knows there's not much to go on. And the lack of any evidence to the contrary, well, I'd say the remains are those of James Martin Scott and I'm down a verdict of death by accident. Yeah, thanks, Coroner. I'll go along with your findings and mark the case closed. <laughs> The crime is done at last, perfect as careful planning could make it. A body dug up from Potter's Field to replace that of the missing inventor. A body charred and burned beyond human recognition. Or is it? 400 miles away in the Great Acme Insurance Building in New York City, a man who works behind a frosted glass door in this building, a door simply marked investigation, is not satisfied with that. Yes, speaking. Pierce, this is Andrews over at the National Association of Insurance Underwriters. Oh, hello, Andrews. You said you wanted to know how many companies have policies written in the name of James Martin Scott of Castleport. Yes, yes, that's right. Did you find out? Yes. The records show three double indemnity policies in the name of James Martin Scott, written by three different companies, each for $25,000. Wow, that's a lot of insurance. It sure is. Uh, to whom are the policies made payable? Executor of estate, William Hugan. Uh-huh. Uh, how long have they been in force? One is a year old. The other two have been in force a little less than four months at time of death. Four months, eh? Mm hmm. Hmm. Uh, one other thing. Uh, what was Scott's income? Brother, there you got a question. He paid more than half of his yearly income in insurance premiums. Hmm. You know, Andrews, I can't help being interested in a guy like that. Yeah. <laughs> Don't blame you. In fact, I think we'll be hearing more about Mr. Scott. Oh? Lots more. Dead or alive. <laughs> Pardon me. You're Sheriff King? Yes. Are you Mr. Pierce? Yes, I am. Uh, thanks for meeting me, Sheriff. Well, I got your wire and it sounded urgent. Thought I'd better meet you at the train. Now, what's it all about? The Scott case. Uh, the crazy inventor, you mean? Well, maybe he's not as crazy as he's that he'd like us to think, Sheriff. Oh. And the trail or something, eh? Well, we're not sure. Well, my office is at your disposal, Mr. Pierce. So is the car. What's your first stop? The home of Mr. William Hugan. <laughs> Hugan's house, Piers. Shared with James Scott. Well, I hope he's at home. Yeah, let's find out. <clears throat> yes? Yeah. Oh, Sheriff King. Yeah, this is Mr. Pierce of the Acme Insurance Company, Mr. Hugan. You'd like to talk here. You mean something's wrong? Oh, purely routine investigation. Before we make payments on insurance policies, we always investigate deaths of this type. Oh, yes, yes, I, I see. Now, uh, the late Mr. Scott was an inventor, I understand. Yes, he was an inventor, Mr. Pierce. He was working on a new oil refining process at the time of his death. I see. Well, tell me about him. He lived on the royalties from previous inventions, I suppose. Yes, uh, royalties. Uh-huh. Uh, was he seen by anybody in his workshop, I mean, the evening of the accident? I can answer that, Pierce. 
The fellow that lives on the outskirts of town is a local junk dealer. There's with Scott and Hugan here just a few seconds before the explosion. Junk dealer, eh? Yeah. Interesting characters, most of them. They pick up things. Yeah. <laughs> well, sorry to have bothered you, Hugan. Glad to be of any help I can. Oh? This photograph here on the desk. Is uh, this Scott? Yes. Taken some time ago, of course. Uh-huh. Had beautiful teeth, didn't he? Well, thanks again, Mr. Hugan. Don't mention it. Yeah, it seems to me, Pierce, that uh, the questions you ask could sort of put Hugan on his guard. That's what I intended, Sheriff. The insurance companies have a big stake in this case. We, well, we thought it'd be interesting to see what Hugan will do once we let him know that we suspect him. Yeah, well, there's one thing, Pierce... Hugan is no fool. Never turned his hand at much in this town. But I want to warn you, he's smart as they come. Does he think so? Uh, afraid he does. So much the better, Sheriff. Well, now I'd like to make a long-distance phone call and then have a nice chat with, uh, what's his name, that local junk dealer? Hanson. Oh, yes, yes, Hanson. <laughs> Interesting characters, junk dealers. <laughs> That's the way it happened, Mr. Pierce. Couldn't have been more than a minute after we stepped out the door that the whole shack exploded and went up in flames. I see. Uh, one more question, Mr. Hanson. Mm, glad to answer if I can. Your business is buying and selling junk. Yes, sir. Now, there must have been a lot of metal and tin in the ruins of Scott's workshop. Mm, certainly was. I got a couple of loads of stuff out of there. Of course, I got the sheriff's permission to sift the ashes before I started. Yeah, that's right, Pierce. That was after we finished our investigation, too, of course. Did you find anything is- interesting, Mr. Hanson? Mm, wasn't anything much of value, but... Jumping Jehoshaphat. Why didn't I think of that before? Of uh, what, Mr. Hanson? Oh, I dogged if I didn't find a tin box of fuses in the ashes. All burned, of course, but you could see they were good before the fire started. Fuses? Now, why didn't you tell me this before, Hanson? Mm, didn't think of it before. Well, why did Scott send us out for fuses when he had a whole box of them in his workshop? Yes, that is an interesting question. Yeah. It looks to me as if those two went out of their way to have a witness present just before the fire appears. Yes, yeah, Sheriff. Sheriff, mm-hmm. can you write an order to have Scott's body exhumed? Sure I can. Good. Professor Barker, the pathologist at the State University, is on his way here now. Maybe he can tell us if the deceased was alive or dead at the time the fire started. <laughs> Well, Professor, you got some news? Uh, gentlemen, I finished the examination. Yeah? Uh, can I use your wash basin here, Sheriff? Oh, sure. Help yourself, Professor. Here's a towel. I'll take the soap around here someplace. Uh, where is that? Oh, here it is. Ah. There you are. Thank you. Uh, yeah. That's better. Well, Professor, what did you find? Uh, well, as you know, uh, the body was almost totally destroyed in the flame. But I was fortunate in finding a small piece of lung tissue. And now, if the deceased had been alive and breathing at the time the fire started, he'd naturally have inhaled smoke. Naturally? Uh, the smoke would have been deposited small carbon granules in the bronchial passages of the lung. In the body I've examined, there was no carbon deposit at all. You mean he was dead before the fire started? Exactly. Uh, however... In an explosion case of this kind, I uh, shouldn't like to be subjected to cross-examination in court. Why not? Well, it's perfectly possible the man was struck by a flying object created by the explosion and killed instantly, uh, before he could inhale any smoke. Well, just the same. It's beginning to check with some things I found out. <clears throat> Scott's dentist says Scott had all his teeth. The body found in the fire had five teeth missing. Sheriff. You and I feel pretty sure by now that this body isn't Scott's. But a jury, Sheriff. Are they going to think so? I doubt it. There's only one way to prove it. We've got to find the real Scott. Chief, Investigation Division, Acme Insurance Company, New York City. Reasonable doubt, body found in flames, is that of James Martin Scott. Suggest you withhold payment of policies for time being. Signed... Here. To all chiefs of police, 
Be on lookout for James Martin Scott, age 41, white, male. Scott is wanted for questioning and suspected fraud. Notifies Sheriff King of Castleport. Full description follows. <laughs> William Hugan, the refusal of the insurance companies to pay the $150,000 is an awkward, but for a smart criminal mind, not an insurmountable obstacle. To Hugan, it means simply that his collaborator, James Martin Scott, now in hiding, must be disposed of, must really die, so that no investigation will ever find him. So, his plans made, William Hugan leaves Castleport quietly, unobtrusively, but not unnoticed by Sheriff King. Here speaking. This is Sheriff King in Castleport. Oh, yes, sir. William Hugan just left town on the express. Bought a ticket for Albany. I've got a deputy following him. And this might be it. Good. Suppose I meet you at police headquarters in Albany as soon as I can get there. Right, Pierce. The quicker we can clean this case up, the better. <laughs> I waited and waited. You, you've got my share of the money, haven't you, William? They, they paid the money, haven't you? Yes. Now, listen. I think I'm being followed. I if they say you, it's all over. Well, I've rented a car. Meet me at 9 o'clock at the corner of Hudson Avenue and Pearl Street. Yes, but, but William, if, if you're being followed... I'll give I... him the shake temporarily. But you do have the money, Yes, right? yes. I told you I'd take care of you. Now, remember, be at the corner of Hudson and Pearl at 9 o'clock sharp. <laughs> driven far enough, William. Can't we stop somewhere and, and talk now? Yes. This looks like a good spot. Oh, it certainly is lonely enough out here. Now, William, if you'll just give me my share of the insurance money, I'll get... Get a... out of the car, James. Out of the car? But... I said get out. This is the end of the road. Oh, William, if this is a joke... I... What? What's that? A knife, James. Knife? Yes. You see, there won't be any money, as long as you're alive. No, no, William. This isn't the way it was to be. Not the way at all. You won't get out, (laughs) then. Police, this is the Dunlop car running service. You fellas asked for a check of all cars rented tonight. Well, one of my cars was just returned. Big spot on the front seat. Yeah, mud all over the floorboard and pedals. Better come down and take a look. Police headquarters, this is Jim Brown out in the turnpike. Yeah, I want to report a prowler on the land tonight, out in the East Meadow. I saw his flashlight, but he was gone by the time I got there. Uh, I'll tell you this, though, he buried something out there. Now, you better come out and see what it is. Oh, Clark. Clark. Will you give me my bill, please? I'm checking out. Where uh, you going somewhere, Hugan? Sheriff King. Mr. Mr. Pierce. And this is Detective Grayson of the Albany Police, Huck Hugan. He wants you to be his guest for an extended stay. I, I can't imagine what you it's want no me to... good, Hugan. You made too many mistakes. And your last one led us to Scott. We found his body. You know, Hugan, Scott was an amazing fellow. The only man I ever knew of who died twice. <laughs> Under close questioning by Sheriff King, the Albany police, and Pierce, the insurance investigator, William Hugan finally admitted his guilt. And in the trial that followed, the courts of justice decreed that he must die in the electric chair for the murder of James Martin Scott. Greed, forgetfulness, the small mistakes that are the age-old heritage of those who set themselves against justice, thus shattered another dream of the perfect crime. Now, in Investigator Pierce's office in New York, Miss Perkins. Yes, sir. Take the file on William Hugan and James Martin Scott and mark it case closed. Justice triumph. Although the names of all persons, characters, and places are entirely fictitious, and any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental, this dramatization was based on an actual murder case. Next week at the same time, the Mutual Broadcasting System will present 
Justice, and Sarah Curtis. A story of a man who tried to mix murder and forgery and succeeded in neither. Another dramatization taken from the files of True Justice series appearing each week in the New York Sunday News and its syndicate. These programs are produced and directed by Jock McGregor, and tonight's dramatization was by Gene Hurley. The narrator is George Carson Putnam. Pierce was played by Arnold Robertson, William Hugan by Don Douglas, and Sheriff King by Craig McDonald. Others in the cast were Humphrey Davis as James Scott, Julian Noah as Hanson, Margaret Berlin as Mrs. Hanson, and Ian McAllister as the coroner and Professor Barker. The orchestra, under the direction of Emerson Buckley, played music especially written for this broadcast by Richard DuPage. You know, you can have a lot of fun watching a two-year-old go through his routine. A lot of fancy ways of locomoting about the house. A lot of fancy talk to make you grin from ear to ear. Of course, there's a sober business of supporting him. And yes, in the not-too-far-off future, the business of sending him to college. It'd be a wise thing if you thought of that between grins. U.S. savings bonds, for instance. They're an excellent way of saving for that education. You should get them, and get them regularly, either through the payroll savings plan where you work, or the bond-a-month plan where you bank. Almost everyone knows about the payroll savings plan, but the bond-a-month plan is something brand new. It's an arrangement between you and your bank. You join the bond-a-month plan. The bank buys the bond for you, delivers it to you, charges it to your checking account. Easy, automatic, and, yes, profitable. Because U.S. savings bonds still pay off $4 on maturity for every three you invest. Next time you're at your bank, tell the teller you're interested in joining the bond-a-month plan. Or where you work, Get full information about the payroll savings plan. Ralph Paul speaking. This program came from New York. For another exciting drama, stay tuned now for Scotland Yard starring Basil Rathbone as Inspector Burke. In just a moment, you'll hear The Case of the Tyrant's Nest. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.